just trying to change the world here, people. Oh, really? The Facebooking and the tweeting and the Instagramming, all that would not exist without our understanding of science. So it's amazing that you took that as an insult. You mean true for you is different from true for anybody else? Have yeah, something absolutely, true because I can't think either got to be true or not. I can't, no, no. Welcome to O'Reilly Radio number 112 for Friday, June 3rd, 2016, where we dismantle the current events for your edutainment through mostly rational conversations that make you go, oh, really? I'm your host, Andy Cowan, with my usual suspects. I've got Fred Sims directly beneath me, and I've got Daniel Atherton bringing up the rear. What? Well, yeah, sort of. Sort of bringing up the rear. Right? I- I'm just a little man on the totem pole. Low Te- man on technically, the totem well, that just means that you're supporting us all. He's the back half of the human centipede. Oh wow! I got oh, a raw deal here. Wow, that went that went dark. That went dark. Okay, well, welcome citizens oh. of Netlandia to <laughs> to this show, <laughs> such as it is. Um, audience feedback, participation in the show. You know, we make mistakes, and, uh, you know, if you find one, you ought to let us know about that. So if you're listening to us in podcast or on the YouTube after the fact, then how about you go ahead and pause that, and you send us an email about what we did wrong at a really radio podcast at gmail.com. Or, of course, if you, if you cannot contain your rage, I recommend that you just pick up the phone and you leave us a sternly worded message at 470 222 Six seven five nine, or you know, if if you've already screamed yourself hoarse at the horrible things that we've done to you, you can then just go ahead and text it in too. Also, we take texts at four seven zero two 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 six seven five nine. But you know, the email that works too if it's long form. You know, if you can't get it out in, in a tweet, which you know you could tweet at us too. Oh, really? Radio, you know, at Oh, really? Radio, you know, yeah, we'll take it all. We'll take it all. Just let us know how bad we have treated you. Or how good we've treated you. That's always an option, but it's a slimmer option. So you can always always uh, get that out there, too. Yeah, we prefer the good. We do, but, you know, yeah. I'll take it all. We'll, we'll take your all-caps rant. That's fine. Absolutely, absolutely. No publicity is bad publicity. I'm, I'm in that vein right now. Such as it is. So, gentlemen, what are you going to do for the end of the world? Because, you know, it's now. Did you know that? No. Now yeah. is the end of the world. Apparently, I'm going to do a podcast for the end of the world. That's what. Apparently, that is what we're doing. Yeah. Podcast for the end of the world. Podcasting yes. from the end of the world. Here we are at a really radio. So, <laughs> you know that pesky little Mayan thing? Yeah. Uh, apparently, they just like misread it or had a typo. There was some miscalculation on someone's part. So. As the article reads, because this came across, scholars released the latest date for the apocalypse, June 3rd, 4th. They're not quite sure, or maybe it's a time zone thing. Not sure. that They weren't really specific. So, as four years after the deadline for the end of the world, as set by the Mayan calendar, came and went without incident, scholars across the world have been trying to put their head together to understand how the advanced knowledge of the Mayans had gone wrong. I, I can't figure out exactly the level of sarcasm or seriousness in this article. I it's really vague. I'm I'm not sure that they're serious, but anyway, it turns out that it hadn't. Uh, modern day scholars were the ones who got the date wrong. Did you know that? Yeah, yeah. A series of miscalculations led to the faulty date, which has now been revised to 5 days from today, June 3rd, 4th. That would be today. Sorry. Uh, Of course, if you're listening to this after the fact, you have survived yet another end of the world. Congratulations. Golf clap. Golf clap. You have survived the end of the world again, and all you got was this lousy podcast. (laughs) Good for you. Um, It was earlier believed that at the end of the Mayan calendar marked the end of a 5,126-year-long cycle in the Mesoamerican Long Count Calendar. This would mean that a new era of positive energy on Earth and the beginning of a new age. This is believed to be a cryptic message marking the end of the world. I suppose? No, it's, it, it, the Mayans just had a calendar that went yeah. so long and then starts over. That, 
that's it. Because the overachieving calendar maker was like, I'm pretty good at 5,000 years, right? Like, I can stop now? <laughs> it's like, you know, at, at that point, it's just probably going to wrap around. You know, I'll, I'll let them finish it. it. It'll start, it just starts over again. Like your calendar that you get in Bards and Noble. It's, <laughs> it's just starting over again. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that. Uh, quoting Anthony Avini, an expert in ancient Mesoamerican astronomy at Colgate University. As far as we know, the people of Mesoamerica, the Maya included, didn't care about leap years. Okay, here leap is years. the first problem with this article. And this is where Andy was saying it's kind mm -hmm. of hard to determine whether or not it's serious or a joke. Yeah. Um, Anthony Aveni, if you are an expert in ancient Mesoamerican astronomy at Colgate University... Um, they didn't care about leap years because leap year hadn't been invented yet for them to care about. That might yeah. be a thing. Yeah. No one even knew what the hell a leap year was. Right. Since leap years were developed after the fact by Gregorian monks to try and reconcile the calendar that they had created. Yep. After the Julian calendar, which was still off. Anyway, I, I wrote an article about the origins of the of the calendar you can go ahead and search that on on our web page and you'll find it you know where all that came from that? we've discussed it a few times yeah I mean, when we had our leap year episode you exactly know, leap day episode, things we... things keep coming up apparently though like the end of the world so uh our philosophy about leap year is a complicated scheme to make the seasons jive with the calendar of any said they were more concerned that time should be unbroken not interfered with and that the count of time should have continuity. So then there was a, the whole calculation and everything, and and they they went on and on and on. And there's there's this astrological star chart that they did. Uh. Um, for some of you out there of that mindset, you'll look and it's like, hey, wow, that that means something. It doesn't. <laughs> Not really. It um, means red lines on a chart. Yeah, well, no, there's some green lines in there, too, and a couple black and and, and the blue. There's a blue line. Um, yeah. Uh, something. Yeah. So at, at the very end, of course, there is also the perfect square Grand Cross alignment on June 4th this year. The Cardinal Grand Cross is an alignment with four planets all squaring each other. A square aspect is a 90-degree separation between planets. It causes friction. You know, that S thing that doesn't exist out there. Says Adam Somer on his webpage, Astrology with Adam Somer. So all of this comes down to astrology, and if you believe in such things, then why are you listening to this podcast? <laughs> I mean, really? <laughs> This is not the show for you. <laughs> okay. No, this is the show for you. Keep, li keep no, listening. Keep uh, sharing. That's true. And keep getting angry. Yeah, that's we'll, true. We'll that's direct true. you in the right path. I mean, it, it's just one of those things. It's <laughs> like that's one of those where you can't tell, even through the whole thing, whether or not that's satire or seriousness. But, uh, you know, don't hide faulty logic behind math and think that you're coming out all right. Yeah. The Mayans didn't know... What even a leap year was, they were 365 because for them, the day started at a certain time. It ended at a certain time as directed by the sun and mm -hmm. the stars. That's how it worked. So you don't just get to add 1,200 days to the end of their calendar because all of a sudden someone invented leap years so that we could keep the seasons in line. That's not, that's not how this works. Right. And then when you put things like this out on the internet for people to read and then you make it like purposely vague and very hard to determine you know is this real is this not you just put it in the minds of people yeah. oh my god it's the end time that we need to stay away from end <laughs> times talk yeah. as much as possible it will be the end of days for you when your brain and heart and body stop working in conjunction and you are dead that's pretty much how that works that is pretty much how that works that is the only end times you need to be concerned with exactly so with um with that, uh, though, I did notice that there was there was one one part that you know it makes sense that they would think this. I I know it, it's strange, but their calendar was continuous. It was our calendar 
that has the leap years. So that's what they're trying to adjust for. They're not trying to adjust for their calendar. They're trying to adjust for our calendar. Right, but... To, if, to if, square it up. If the original calendar is their calendar and it ends at a certain time, you don't just get to add the time to... You know what I'm saying? Like, that, right, that's yeah. not how it yeah. works. Well, but, no, well, no, they they didn't add time that way. They're trying to add time to what the original calculations to take into account that our calendar is simply whack. Right, but that's going. Yeah, that's our, taking our, our wonky. They're trying to reconcile the two calendars mm-hmm. and they're doing it in weird ways. Right, they're they're taking what is a made up function of our calendar, going back to the beginning <laughs> right. and counting over, and that's not how it works. If their calendar went so many years. It's because that's what their days were, you know, like, so their end date is still the same, regardless of whatever new math you try to spin it with. Yep. But that's the problem. You spin it with math and then people are like, oh, that totally makes sense. Yes, mathematically, it makes a ton of sense because the math is right there. You can do it. But logically, no, their calendar still ended on the same day. But, you know, all that friction and stuff. Yeah. All that space friction. There there was. There was like a five to ten mile asteroid. Oh God, they were right. It was the end times. Yeah, it, for that for that asteroid desert for that, that asteroid. <laughs> <laughs> it hit somewhere in Arizona, and there was so there's there's going to be a lot of uh, a lot of meteorite fragments. So those of you that are uh, that are of a mindset to go uh, find those, you know, get out your metal detectors and go uh, go gallivant across the. The, 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 wide open, desert. the wide open spaces of the Arizona desert. Uh, the flash was apparently visible all the way through uh, to New Mexico. So it was a big flash. It was, you know, like blinded out webcams that far away. So big deal. Big deal. Um, which also just says, you know, to me, in honor of one of our hosts that, uh, that has been rather busy with life, the universe, and everything, we got to get off this rock. <sighs> Well, I mean, other rocks are yeah. trying to get on this rock, so we that, should... Well, that's true. Oh, oh, they want all over this. <laughs> oh, just... Is it just you? Is it your magnetic personality? No, no, the rock. The rock that we're on. They just want all over it. Oh, yes, yes. Well, the, there was a uh, there was a statement by Neil deGrasse Tyson. He was, uh, he was asked whether or not us sending up rockets and things was uh, removing mass from the Earth and whether or not that would actually matter. And he said there's more space dust, you know, particulate matter, coming in every day, tons of it, that just kind of, it burns up, but it's still adding mass slowly. Yeah. uh, That it more than makes up for anything that we send up. So we've got that going for us, which I suppose is nice. And, uh, yes, Mama Van, I, I, too, thought it odd that we're having Reason Rally uh, this weekend in Washington, D.C., a group of roughly thirty to 50,000 uh, secular-minded individuals uh, heading to Washington, D.C. to basically express their, their hearness, their, that we do exist— those that are not religious, that have a mind towards science, rational thought, climate change, things of that nature, you know, look for the evidence. We support evidence-based claims, things like that. Uh, they have descended on Washington, D.C. There will be many, many speakers, and I do have a link down in the show notes where you can watch uh, any of their live streams. They're, uh, they're, they've partnered with a couple different uh, podcasts and other groups, and they're going to be streaming it out on on YouTube, I believe. Uh, so, if you can't be there, be there in spirit. I couldn't be there this year um, due to just financial means and things like that. So, this is the best I got. I've got you guys. I've got my own little reason rally here on O'Reilly Radio. So, yay! Maybe maybe next year. I don't know. I don't know how often they're going to do it. It was very important because it's an election year, and they're doing a lot of. Um, uh, campaigning, going into uh, um, uh, what were they calling it? It was um, advocacy day, or hmm, now I can't remember where they'd go and and see the uh, state representatives and and talk to them and and you know get their opinion and and all that. Big big wheel of cheese day. No, that's different. Uh, 
but not very. Though it has cheese. So, Everything's yeah. better with cheese. Everything, and really everything is better with cheese. Andrew Jackson, our most insane president. Uh, well, to date. To date. <laughs> we may, we may have oh, one in the running for that. Always room for real change. soon. <laughs> most genocidal president. Okay, most genocidal president. Check. Got that one. Okay. Hmm. I though. Yeah. Yeah. I guess Jackson would still be it. Are you going yeah. to compare yeah. him to a mighty big bomb that Truman dropped? I was thinking it's like that. Well, but that's not really genocide. No, because he, he wasn't you know, systematically wiping out a particular race. With right. The bomb. Yeah. No. No. That that was just you know, the we're going to end this. We're going to end this right now. <laughs> it's called. Uh, we're we're losing a lot of guys. Is the big the, the big the, bluff? The, yeah. The nerds in the back say that we have this weapon that will stop the war. So um, let's use it. Of course, it could also set the atmosphere on fire, too. We're not sure. I let's, trust him. Let's find out. Let's take a chance. <laughs> so you're saying there's a chance. Okay, let's go. <laughs> All right. So uh, speaking of that kind of history, Fred, I think you've got something else for us. I do. I do indeed. Um, I ran across something kind of interesting. It was an op-ed piece for a small online paper, uh, the York Daily Review during my interneting today. The opinion presented in this piece was that of Lawrence Goldman of the York Township. You know, nobody famous, nobody special, regular everyday average citizen. And he was of the opinion that it's time to reinterpret the Second Amendment. Now, I'm not going to get into the Second Amendment conversation here because, you know, basically that'll lend itself to an entire show. I just found it interesting or that... five. Yeah. yeah that, <laughs> you know, interesting that today, June 3rd, 2016, I happened to read this article. Interesting because it ties into an argument conservatives in the NRA love to spout regarding they'll take your guns. More so interesting because today's history shows exactly how something like taking your guns would look. Without getting into a giant conversation regarding the Second Amendment, I do think it's important to at least gloss over the main point of the always controversial amendment. Uh, that being, you know, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. I'm still not trying to engage any real Second Amendment conversation, but I believe this logically lends itself to individuals with training and for the purposes of militia or military use should have guns. Now, I'm going to dodge the bullet that is dissecting <laughs> that conversation any further, and I will bring about today's bit of history. On June 3rd, 1916, the signing of the National Defense Act uh, occurred by then-President Woodrow Wilson. The National Defense Act's main purpose was to expand the size and scope of the National Guard, which at the time was a network of states' militias that had been developing steadily since colonial times, and it guaranteed its status as the nation's permanent reserve force. For anyone who missed the significance of that statement, the President of the United States essentially conscripted state-run and regulated militias and turned them into a federally regulated feeder unit for the armed forces. The National Defense Act also set up qualifications for National Guard officers, allowing them to attend Army schools. All National Guard units would now be organized according to the standards of regular Army units, and for the first time, National Guardsmen would receive payment from the federal government, not only for their annual training, which increased from 5 to 15 days, but also for their drills, which were increased from 24 per year to 48. And finally, the National Defense Act formally established the Reserved Officer Training Corps, the ROTC, to train and prepare high school and college students for Army service. And while I will concede that this act is not an example of taking the guns out of the hands of the people, this is the type of step a government intent on taking your guns would implement. And while I've got you thinking about the novelty of an idea <laughs> like our government disarming the people, I think it's time for a logical fallacy. And on that note, we are on to an appeal to novelty. Convenient. Go for it. All right. An appeal to novelty is the opposite of an appeal to antiquity. Appeals to novelty assume that the newness of an idea is evidence of its truth. They are thus related to the bandwagon fallacy. That an idea is new certainly doesn't entail that it is true. Many recent ideas have no merit whatsoever, as history has shown, Every idea, including those that we now reject as absurd beyond belief, were new at one time. Uh, some ideas are now new now will surely go the same way. Uh, example, 
String theory is the most recent development in physics. Therefore, string theory is true. Eh. Another example. <laughs> Religion is old-fashioned. Atheism is a much more recent development. Therefore, atheism is true. Eh. Each of these arguments commits the appeal to novelty fantasy. Uh, the former takes the newness of string theory to be evidence that string theory is true. The latter takes the newness of atheism to be evidence that atheism is true. Merely being a new idea, of course, is no guarantee of truth. The newness of string theory and atheism alone, then, should not be taken as evidence of truth of these two positions. Indeed. Hi, O'Reilly Radio listeners. This is your host, Andy Cowan, calling my voicemail to make sure that it still works. Please consider calling us, 470-222-6759. Bye. So with the um, with that, with that argument, just you know, because it's new, it's obviously true. We we know that that's patently false, right? Yeah. I mean, what what other examples could could we think of other than uh, the the very serious bias that, uh, that this particular website has um, with the old AC, atheism thing? Um, um. I was thinking um, new school regulations, like ways of teaching. That that that's a decent one. Uh, well, I mean, it also depends on what you define as new. So, I mean, look right. at um, autism caused by vaccines. Oh, uh, it's it's it a has. newer argument, but it, obviously patently false. It's been proven as yep. such many times. So, um, and it's just one of those things. Like that is honestly one of the worst arguments for something being true ever but like oh it's brand new so that must mean it's true but like no it's brand new so no one's been able to look at it like yeah. maybe we should do a little more research before we just go around saying oh that's new that's yeah. right um new operating <laughs> systems being so secure but they're yeah. brand new they've never been tested truth should be boring it should be well tested yeah. by science that's true truth should be boring but, but that's boring. Not, so is infrastructure, but it's needed to, for the, the survival yeah, of the state and country. That's true. You really want infrastructure to be boring. You want that bridge to not move. You want it to just be a bridge. You don't want it to fly away. No. Infrastructure is important. And let's see what else is important. If you wish to make an apple pie from scratch, you must first... Invent the universe. If you're scientifically literate, the world looks very different to you. It's not just a lot of mysterious things happening. There's a lot we understand out there. And that understanding empowers you. If you base medicine on science, you cure people. If you base the design of planes on science, they fly. If you base the design of rockets on science, they reach the moon. It works, bitches. That's right, it works, bitches, and this is something that uh, that I really want to take a look at. Oh, this, yeah. It's a gunshot plugging device, and it uh, it was theorized that this thing, it, it basically, uh, if if you guys are watching in our live stream, you'll see that, uh, that there's this black gloved hand that has a strange looking syringe. I mean, it's large. It, it's it is not small. It's intimidating. How about that? It's an intimidatingly large syringe, but there's no needle on uh, on it. Uh, at, in fact, at the other end, there's a, kind of like a gray grommet-looking thing where what's inside, which, honestly, it looks like um, Smarties. It looks like a, <laughs> it looks like a giant thing filled with Smarties, like mm, sugary candy, but they're not that either. They're actually sponges, small sponges. So, what this does, and graphically, you shove it in a gunshot wound, and you pull squeeze, the and you pull the trigger. You squeeze all those little sponges into the wound, stopping you from bleeding to death. It 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 it, it plugs up the wound quickly and effectively, so that you can then receive necessary surgery without bleeding out. Yep. Uh, it was approved for military service back in 2014. Oh, by the way, it's also known as XSTAT. X-S-T-A-T. All in caps, by the way. Um, so, approved in 2014, uh, but it's actually been used now. 
So this this was in the field, ready for such a treatment. Action. Yep. Um, let's see the uh, the hemostatic device developed by Rev Medex Inc. Uh, was used by the United States Forward Surgical Team, FST, after it failed to staunch severe bleeding in a patient using standard techniques. The Extat Rapid Hemostatus System works by pumping expandable tablet-sized sponges into the wound, staunching bleeding while a patient is rushed to the hospital. Extat is designed to treat severe bleeding in areas susceptible to junctional wounds, such as the axilla the space below the shoulder where the vessels and nerves enter and leave the upper arm and groin once injected the sponge-like tablets rapidly expand within a wound and exert hemostatic pressure to stop the bleeding each sponge contains an x-ray marker to confirm surgical removal after surgery that's a good that's brilliant right there <laughs> that's kind of the important thing <laughs> yeah it's like you know we got to make sure that we get all of these out so I think the only other thing that you know you could ask for is like uh, like dissolving um, uh, d dissolving s sutures. Yeah, you know, maybe if they just eventually went away, that would be good. That would be nice too. But I imagine if you're going after any sort of gun wound or puncture wound where this would be relevant, uh, I guess you're going to have some surgery time anyway. Yes. Yeah, so you might as well. the size of the unit, yeah. Yeah, well, it's... That and uh, it's the, the amount of time that you may have travel from where you got shot to where you're going, especially if they're using it in a military um, uh, uh, Yeah, a, a forward response yeah. team You're going to is... want it to last longer than what you may be able to develop for... You know, I, I mean, I know you can draw out the, um, dis you know, dissolving part of it, but... Yeah, it, this is a better option than oh crap! It's actually dissolving. We've got to get to work. Yeah, yeah. So in this case, um, the soldier suffered a gunshot wound to the left thigh. After seven hours of unsuccessful surgery to stop the bleeding, the doctors decided to use the Xstat. I I would have thought that they probably should have maybe tried it earlier, but it's it, yeah. it hasn't been proven in the field yeah. yet. They want to exhaust all options before going to the unproven thing. Yep. Yeah. Uh, so there is a detailed description. Uh, you can follow the link to this article and then follow the link to the deeper, I'm sure, much more vivid picture of exactly what happened. Uh, Y'all can in, have fun with that. Yeah, in the, uh, the Journal of Emergency Medical Services. I bet that's a nice read. Um, oh. quote the, quoting from it, uh, just a little excerpt. The femoral artery and vein were transected and damaged to the femur and soft tissue tissue left a sizable cavity in the leg. Oh, jeez, ow. After yeah, a that, that's their time reading. Now, this guy's a professional. After a self-applied tourniquet <laughs> stopped the bleeding, the patient was transferred to an FST for evaluation and treatment. After proximal and distal control of the vessels was achieved, several hours were spent by the team trying to control residual bleeding from the bone and accessory vessels. Throughout the course of the roughly seven-hour surgery, multiple attempts at using bone wax and cautery on the bleeding site were unsuccessful, and the patient received multiple units of blood and plasma. Eventually, the FST team opted to use the Xstat and applied a single Xstat device to the femoral cavity, oh, geez. Uh, resulting in a nearly immediate homeostasis. Uh, the, the patient was stabilized and eventually transported to a definitive care facility. So, woohoo! Micro sponges! Science. In your, in your femoral cavity. Medical uh, science right I'm, there. I'm already nauseous. I know, that's... Ooh, <laughs> but, you know... I, I'm green. This is, this is the kind of thing that, now that it's worked on the battlefield, this is the kind of thing that's also going to end up, like... In the back of a squad car. In Chicago. You know, first first responders kind of thing. Maybe with something less intimidating. Maybe they'll have a small junior size as opposed to the super size one. Maybe there that's not the super size one. I don't know. I mean, they may need it to be that size because of the size of the sponges. It's just... Fair. You could have smaller sponges. You know? I mean, as long as they, yeah. you know, uh, worked in the same way. Because it's, it's part of the... 
they get in there and stop the bleeding, but it's also because they expand and exert pressure. So, mm-hmm. it, I mean, it, it's that whole thing. Do they need to be the same size? Can we make them smaller? That's true. Well, we don't know. that They did. They looked very much like a Smarty. You know, I think we've all had that little candy. Uh, you know, maybe the size of a, a, a standard size adult bear aspirin. You know, maybe that'll that'll give you another idea. We don't know how big it gets from that, because that's dry. You know, as soon as it hits um, blood flow, blood, <laughs> yeah, it's going to inflate with that blood. But how much? I don't know. There's a lot of them in there, so I don't know. That's up to that that company to continue to work on their life saving technology. Good job, guys. Good job, though. So, what if you can't get to them in time? How about another article here? How about we turn them into a zombie? Brain-dead people could be brought back to life thanks to new biotech experiment. Close that pop-up. Okay, there we go. The Reanima Project... Which, has I'm, which I'm going to go ahead and say right now <laughs> is the name of a company in, in, in a horror movie. It's, no. It is now. <laughs> no. no. <laughs> okay, okay. The Reanima Project has just received approval to begin the first human neuroregeneration and neuroreanimation project, which could revive Brit. Brain dead individuals. <laughs> well, zombies, oh, this is how we get zombies. I, I added them. <laughs> I, I know this is under science, but this is firmly yeah. under bad idea. Are you sure? B- I mean, bad idea. Well, no, no. Okay, okay. So, one of my favorite book series that you know every every listener of this is already know knows at this point. Um, you know Peter F. Hamilton's you know the Commonwealth series, you know the Void trilogy and all that. They have rejuvenation treatments in that where you can basically, you know, rejuvenate the whole body. But the brain, that's something that we, you know, current day people, have had a real hard time with rejuvenating. So maybe if you can rejuvenate a fully healthy brain, or a brain that, um, that only has maybe a little bit of Parkinson's, or only a little bit of Alzheimer's, you know, regenerate that... Then you're not dealing with brain-dead individuals. You're dealing with alive people, and you're making their brain healthier. But yes, this is how you get zombies. Yeah. (laughs) The way you describe it, Andy, I'm all for that. Because (laughs) as my body either becomes artificial or I just find a way to keep it young or, you know, send it back towards when it was young... I need my brain to stay on that level. I don't want mm-hmm. it to get old. So, yeah. yes, rejuvenating my brain, putting the stem cells in, letting them do their thing. My brain stays young. I stay viable. I get to live to 250 or whenever I feel like dying at that point. That's right. awesome. When I die, they bring me back and I attack my grandchildren because <laughs> I need the brains to keep me alive. <laughs> the Reanima Project has essentially turned me into a flesh-eating zombie. That's the bad idea. Your idea? Great. Zombies, bad idea. Well, yeah, zombies are a bad idea. I think I think we have a real hard time uh, with people coming back from the dead. Anyway, that that seems to be a phobia that us living folks have. Well, well, uh, actually, it's rather primal. Yeah, dead, um, we've dead needs the, to stay dead. Yeah, we've already <laughs> disposed of you. Yeah. Well, it, it's actually a, a primal fear that was originally meant to keep us safe, and that we've used as a. Uh, means for entertainment. Um, you're supposed to fear death and the dead because the corpses, again, decay, foment disease, all sorts of nasty stuff. So our, our, our lizard brain knows that stay away from dead things unless they're tasty knobs. Um, <laughs> yeah. And as uh, we move to the mammalian brain, it's like, no, there's going to be flies, maggots, all sorts of nasty things. Let's keep away from that. Well, I mean, and it, it leads Once itself... we got to the human brain, we went, hmm, dead thing's bad. So if we sprinkle some magic, undead thing's bad. Ooh, this is intriguing. So the Reanima Project, a project to assess the possibility of regenerating the brains of dead people, has just received approval from an institutional review board at the National Institutes of Health in the U.S. and in India. So we may have 
We may have an outbreak in India. You never know. Uh, Bio, the, the company's name is BioQuark Inc. Um, they are the brains behind Reanima. Um, <laughs> hey, that's in the article. That pun is in the article. Um, and they apologized. And for they it. did apologize for it, but I wasn't going to. Um, <clears throat> they were given the go-ahead to work with 20 patients already declared clinically dead from traumatic brain injury to test whether parts of their central nervous system can be brought back to life. Um, this is through you don't the use of. Read it creepy. You could just read it normal. No, I have to read it creepy. I obviously have to read it creepy. This is editorializing. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> through the use of different therapies, the company will try to revive the patients who are only kept alive through life support. <laughs> No? This is making it so much worse. <laughs> no, it's it so much really better. Does, it really does. It contacts it in a whole different direction. <laughs> when you're reading it, it is an episode of like, no, no. Tales from you, the Crypt. You got to get through the last sentence, though, with the creepiness. Okay. <laughs> <clears throat> These therapies include injecting the brain with stem cells and a cocktail of peptides, as well as deploying lasers and nerve stimulation techniques that have been shown to bring patients out of comas. Is that... Cocktail of peptides yes. deploying lasers. Yes. That's my new favorite thing. <laughs> okay, I'll move on now. So, yeah. Uh, we're going to have zombies, uh, so that might be the end of the world. Yeah. So that jibes well with our first story. It does. And and really, <laughs> we have a lot of people in the United States. We're rife for a zombie outbreak. But Indi India. Yeah. <laughs> That's a pandemic yeah. waiting to happen. Yeah, you couldn't turn around without bumping into a zombie if they started biting each other in India. They, they have no. they have a lot of people that are already half dead, yeah. And it's one of the best places uh, to start your, your, your infection if you're playing Plague Inc. And... No, Mama Fan, we did not say Reenema. No. no, that's a whole other company. That, that we're not doing the human centipede thing. But Let's oddly, a company I fear less. <laughs> I, you know, I, I don't want a enema, much less Reenema. <laughs> Let, let, let's move you know, on. There's, there's got to be more science here somewhere. Enema, right? the sequel. Yes, there is. There's one more story, and then we'll, uh, then we'll break. Uh, this is out on Physics Buzz, physicscentral.com. Uh, new terahertz imaging technique reveals tiny hidden objects. Now, to give you uh, an idea of, of what the heck a terahertz wave is, terahertz are smaller wave. Well, yeah, um, I guess they are smaller, aren't they? Yeah. No, they're larger, longer waves. Are they longer waves? Microwaves? Longer waves? Hmm. Anyway, they're between microwaves and infrared. So they're in that range there. Okay. So this is, it's not, I, I so these could be very damaging waves if not handled properly because we, you know, we use infrared to cook things that heats things up and microwaves get so, get so uh, active that they boil water. You know, they interact with, with water molecules. So it could be very dangerous, which may be why we haven't gotten to this point before. But it, uh, it's basically this is going to allow us to see very small objects that are more embedded in other objects. So a terahertz scanner would be able to look beneath the surface of a microchip and, and scan layers of it in ways like that. So <clears throat> um, let's see here. Do, 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 do. Uh, lay the foundation for a new kind of imaging device with a wide range of applications from studying bacteria to performing quality control in electronics manufacturing. Um, the, the cute little robot head here is a terahertz image taken with the newly developed non-invasive sub-wavelength terahertz imaging setup. Uh, the image size is 2 by 2 millimeters, and the structure was hidden behind a silicon wafer. So so this went through an additional piece of silicon, and it's EDB. So it has really high resolution, because that's small. So to, to see something that small through another object, that's really important. Um, the electromagnetic spectrum, of course, contains a rich collection of tools that we can use to explore the world around us, from x-rays to visible... Uh, to infrared and radio. Each type of light reveals different kinds of information and has applications in its own particular niche. 
Uh, in recent years, the often ignored terahertz parts of the spectrum has been gaining attention. Terahertz radiation falls between the infrared and microwave. Um, most of its fame comes from the fact that it can see through clothing, paper, plastic, ceramics, materials that don't conduct electricity. Terahertz imaging devices have revealed invisible details about famous paintings and defects in space shuttle panels. Uh, lab experiments have shown a range of possible applications like detecting explosive chemicals, identifying hidden weapons. Uh, the millimeter wave scanners found at uh, many modern airports operate in the terahertz range. Oh, okay. I was not aware of that. Um, and even screening for skin cancer. So terahertz radiation is non-ionizing and doesn't damage tissue or DNA. Oh, well, scratch all that stuff that I had said earlier. Weird uh, that it sits right between two dangerous waves, but yeah. it is good. I guess it's just the application of it. I mean, because yeah. microwaves, when they're contained, are okay. And it depends on... I, I guess it, uh, it it harkens back to it's the dose that makes something a poison. Gotcha. You know, how much of it you're going to absorb is whether or not it's dangerous to you. You know, we, we can be on cell phones all day long and that's not going to be a problem. You know, those radio waves are not a problem at all. But then you get up into the microwaves when they're, you know, much smaller wavelengths and it can agitate things and you know, it, it depending on how much uh, power you put through it, I imagine as well. Cuz with um <clears throat> with microwave towers, uh one of the reasons that they discovered microwaves could cook things in the first place was because a technician that was using them for communication uh, realized that uh, the chocolate bar that he had in his pocket would always melt whenever he was near them. And also, uh, a few servicemen out there uh, probably know a few people that uh, forgot to take off their jewelry when they were around some of the towers. Ooh. And they ended up having a... Uh, well, they, they lost their wedding ring because it just took their finger right off. Cauterized it, at least. But yeah, so don't reach up in there and zip. It was okay for your tissue to, to go through for a second, but if you had something that would then catch the waves and then concentrate the waves, yeah, bye-bye. <laughs> so I've known several people that uh, that had that problem in the past. Yeah, so yeah, science science can be messy. From melted chocolate to mis missing fingers. Messy science. Messy, messy science. Um. So along with its promising applications come some drawbacks. The key components of the terahertz imaging device designs are complicated and expensive to make. Eh, shocking. Traditional devices don't work very well for objects smaller than the wavelength of the radiation, which ranges from 0.15 millimeter to 1.5 millimeter. Techniques that do work for small objects are pretty slow and aren't ideal for biological materials, especially if you want to keep them intact. Ah, see, there's the danger. Well, we want to keep that intact. Oh, sorry. <laughs> we cooked it. Uh, in a proof-of-concept experiment, the team of researchers uh, from the University of Exeter, University of Glasgow, and British Defense from Cunity? Uh, Cunetic. Oh, is that what that's supposed to be? Cunetic. Thank you. Cunetic no, it, limited... Re kinetic. Uh, it's kinetic. Kinetic? Kinetic. Yeah. I hate English sometimes. Kinetic. Kinetic limited... Uh, recently demonstrated a new technique uh, for imaging objects in the terahertz with terahertz radiation. The fast, high-resolution technique is capable of imaging tiny objects and hidden structures like some biological features. So this will allow us to find those sponges in the zombies that we've reanimated. Yeah, just bring it all together at the end of the world. No? We have definitely turned this into an end-of-the-world show. Yeah. <laughs> well, the, you know, they, they said it was the end of the world, so I might as well talk about the end of the world. It's not the end of the world. It may be the end of the world as you know it, but it's not the end of the world. Right? Not yet. No? No, I, I didn't think so. I'm so egotistical that I believe that when it's the end of the world as I know it, it's the end of the world for everyone else because, you know... I'm awesome. Because we're all figments of your imagination? That'd be cool. <laughs> well, you know, if, if you get into the hard solipsism problem, you know, we don't necessarily know exactly what we are. That is true. You but know, the, the brain and the vat problem? 
then it becomes, is everyone a figment of my imagination? Am I a figment of someone else's imagination? Where does the original imagination stem from? Are we all just part of a giant computer simulation? We don't know. Hard to say. You know, we're all just the Sims for somebody else's game. That's what Elon Musk believes. He has mentioned some of those crazy bird notions, yeah. Maybe they're not crazy bird, though. The, the problem is that we have to act as if they are. So, you know, we have to remain in this realm of uh, middle space. Such as it is. Okay, so that was enough science, I think, for, for this uh, episode. And that's it for this show. Uh, we will be back uh, next Friday for for the part A of the show at uh, Friday about 9.30 p.m. Eastern. The second half will drop on Wednesday morning uh, for the show. In the meantime, can the conversations continue on the web. Head over to OReallyRadio.com. That's O-R-L-Y-R-A-D-I-O for all the links right at the top of the page. And you can watch us. Uh, so you, uh, you know what? I'm going to start over because I've stumbled on everything that I've just said terribly. Terribly, terribly. Also, I wasn't running the music, so that really just screwed me up. So here we go. There we go. That's much better. Much better. Okay. That's it for this show. We'll be back live next Friday at 930 Eastern. The second half of the show will drop on Wednesday morning. In the meantime, the conversations continue on the web. Head over to O'ReallyRadio.com. That's O-R-L-Y-R-A-D-I-O.com for all the links are at the top of the page. Uh, do... Like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, Tumblr, Google+, and subscribe to the YouTube and Twitch channels so you never miss anything. Uh, of course, you can watch us live, as you have uh, hopefully done tonight, um, and you can join in the fun in the chat room, like Mama Van. Thank you very much. Uh, where was I? I'm losing my mind. Okay, yeah. <clears throat> if you've stayed with us all the way through to the credits, how about you give us a hand? If you have a few dollars to spare, you can contribute to the Patreon and get early access to the show releases, and we'll even get some special perks. Uh, just follow the Patreon link on our webpage, and that'll take you over to patreon.com slash radio. You can also make a one-time donation via the uh, donate button. And if you can't fit us into your rainy day funds, do us a solid and share the show. Leave us a review. And uh, we're always looking for new ideas for the show, so share whatever is on your mind. Shoot us a note to oreallyradiopodcast at gmail.com. Or if you're in a more talkative sort of mood, go ahead and send us a voicemail at 470-222-6759, and we'll, uh, we'll take your call or text there. Can't thank you enough for spending some time with us. Until next time, this has been O'Reilly Radio, part of the Cowan Services Network. Music for the show was created by Kevin McLeod of Incomptech.com. Now, if you happen to be watching live we're going to take a little break and we'll be back in about 10 minutes if you aren't watching live well then the rest of the show we'll see you on wednesday and then of course we'll see you live again next friday toodles <laughs>